how your horse sees. So you're going to all have to stand up. Sorry, but interactive. Oh my God, they're all groaning. All right. Oh my God. Okay. You're going to take your hands and make a little tent. And you're going to put them, park them right underneath of your eyeballs. Okay? So that the point, the top, is right here at the bridge of your nose where your sunglasses sit. And I want you to go for a walk. And you can't cheat. And you can't look down. You're going to keep your head level and you're going to go for a walk. And you're going to find out how your horse sees the world. Eye opening, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah, yeah. Go for a walk. That's a good one. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh oh, there comes trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, John, you got his sunglasses. He's looking down. He didn't even do it right. <laughs> that's a good right. one, huh? That's a good one, huh? That's a good one. Yeah, it is a good one. That's yeah. good. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I'll wait till everybody yeah. gets back oh, yes. to their seats you? Oh. safely. Lilia. One piece. Lily, right? Lilia. Ida. 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 Peter. What's his name? What's his name? I don't know. Teddy. 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 <laughs> ziggy. 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 Zig. Ziggle, zig. Jesus Christ. Okay. Is my mic on? There he goes. <laughs> All right. So now, that's how your horse sees the world. Question? I hate to admit it, but my horse is still wants to crowd the horse in front. I mean, sit right up against her butt. So, is my horse looking past that butt and figuring out how things? Because I always worry she's going to drift yeah. because. Yeah. So, the question is my horse gets close to the horse in front of me, crowds. And is my horse actually looking beyond the horse in front of them? And the answer is yes. That's why their eyes are set where they are, because they're a herd animal. And if you've ever watched wild horses traveling in a herd, they tend to travel fairly close together, but because of where their eye is set, they can see kind of around the horse in front of them. But we're not in the wild observing wild horses doing what wild horses do. We're riding behind riders who are making other decisions, right? So our task to be safe on the trail in this terrain is to be at least a horse length behind. How do you measure if you're a horse length back? How do you know? I can see their back hooks between my horse's ears. So if you can see their back hooks between their ears, you're actually two horse lengths back, which is even better. It's even better, right? But if you're one horse length back, you can see the hocks of the horse in front of you. So at least then, if your horse spooks at something, jumps ahead, you have a spot. If the horse in front of you slams on the brakes, you have a spot to stop. If the horse in front of you whips a 180, hopefully they'll fill up that spot, right? But ideally, you're two horse lengths back where you can see the feet or the, or the, the horse in front of you, and that puts you two horse lengths back, and that's a safe sp spot to be in. Um, because we're in difficult terrain where things go wrong. Plus, if you are that far back, one or two horse lengths back, and you get in the canyons and every, all of a sudden everything slows way the hell down, you're far enough back to maybe make an adjustment to kind of keep your space and hold your space, if you will, um, so that it's safer for you to, to be in that position. Because it's really easy to let your horse just climb all over the one in front that never kicked before today, okay? Because after a while, horses get tired of the other one just breathing on them or slobbering on them or worse yet, stepping on them. Uh, how many people have had a horse stepped on from behind by the other horse, okay? Um, I've been pulled from at least one ride for lameness because I got another, my, and my horse got stepped on or clocked right in the deep flexor tendon by a horse behind. So, um, so in the interest of your own safety and the interest of the safety of the other people, you want to keep that distance. You have to teach your horse to do that. It's not intuitive for them. Their herd animals want to be like the wild mustangs where they're all piled on top of each other. You have to teach them to stay back.
you know, it's imperative that you do that. Absolutely imperative. It's your job to make sure. Uh, I mean, imagine, don't let your horse get hurt, which means you got to rate him. Don't let him crowd. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so rate him properly, you know? I mean, of course, initially, they're, they're all difficult to rate. But, but later on in the ride, it, it's, it's imperative that you do that. Please, don't forget that, okay? Yeah, and they learn it, and they get comfortable with it. Right, they do get comfortable staying back. They get to the point where they know to stay back. My horses, I whisper to them, give them space, and they will automatically just sort of roll back in their pace a little bit, give them space, give them space, and they'll be like, all right. And I'm like, that's good. And then they just kind of click back into this, the pace of the horse in front. Um, it's not rude or inappropriate for you to tell the rider behind you, you need to back up, you need to back off, get off my horse. Okay, if somebody can't control their horse, you're not there to control their horse for them. You are not the wall that keeps them from dealing with crazy town. And thank you again for saying whisper to them. I used to, t I used to on a fresh horse, I used to just stroke their mane, whisper, them, whisper, whisper to them like a lover. Easy, easy, you know what I mean? You know, and, 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 and train them. Yeah, you, you have to train you know. them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have, I, some people are not very verbal, and it's, B, it's both physical and verbal, but like if I hit technical trail as I'm approaching it, because remember this? So I can't get to the technical, and my horse is on top of it, and his eyes are over there, and then say something, right? I have to think 20, 30 feet ahead. So as I'm approaching it, because 20, 30 feet is what, a couple of strides at the trot, right? So I'm a couple strides out, and I'm like, take time, and my horse just drops back in. We navigate whatever it is, and then we're good to go. So think about all of that ahead of time, and it's okay for you to tell the person behind you, I will let you by as soon as I can, but you've got to back that horse off. Because you don't need to get stepped on. That's right? the don't push, from, don't push me from behind. Don't push from behind, yeah, yeah. and don't let somebody and don't pull, pull you either. Yeah. Yeah, you got to ride your own ride um, start to finish. Okay. Uh, so really, this is kind of etiquette and safety tend to sit in the same bucket. There's not a whole lot of separation between etiquette and safety. The etiquette and safety is how you conduct yourself in the vet check, making sure that you're aware of your surroundings. Um, if you see somebody that's got a horse that's just losing its marbles, it's okay to move away, right? If, you, if you've got a horse that you know doesn't do well in a, in a very um, busy environment, maybe you need to wait until there's a kind of a gap, the slowdown in that vet check, and then pick your Pick your battles, right? And then on the trail, communicate. Communicate. I'm on your left. I'm on your right. I'm coming around. Can I, I trail please? Trail please does not mean they are going to suck their horse into a little tiny goat trail on the side and let you blow by immediately because you have somewhere to be, okay? Uh, trail please is that at that rider's discretion in front of you, they will decide when they have a safe spot to pull over. You don't get to decide when it's safe for them, bottom line. And you can't insist that, well, you could have pulled over there. You could have pulled over there. I could have pulled over there, but I'm not going to do it because my horse is going to swing into you, and I don't want to knock you off the trail. I can't pull over there because I don't feel safe there, whatever it is. I will pull over when it's safe for me and my horse to pull over and let you go by. If I tell you I need to dismount and then let you go by, you're going to have to wait, be patient, be courteous, let them get off their horse so that they can keep their horse where it needs to be and let you go by if that's what they need to do. The rider in front of you is in charge of when they get to pull over. Okay. Now, if, they, if they're that rude driver that every time there's like a passing lane, they speed up, <laughs> then you come and you see somebody on the cup committee at the next vet check and you say, you know, I asked this, this rider for trail for the last 12 miles and every time there was a pullout that you could put a semi truck in, they just dropped hammer and ran through it and wouldn't let us by. Now, then that's up to us, ride officials, to go have a conversation with that rider and say, hey, look, you got to move over when somebody wants to go by, okay? We know this is your ride for your day, but it, the whole ride is not your ride, right? That's different, but there again, just try to be patient and understanding. Some people are terrified, especially in the canyons, 
They, they are, they're Hail Mary in their way through that. They're like this the whole time. Mary, Mother of God, you know, pray for me and my, you know. So they're, they think it's over. They're scared spitless. Just try to console them, you know. Talk about something else. What kind of ice cream do you like? You know, get them to just, like, loosen up. Whatever it is. And, uh, and then remind them, you know, when you feel like the timing is right. Hey, you know, when you get a chance, you know, can you let me buy? Kind of a thing. I think most riders, when they don't want to let riders buy, they're afraid their horse is going to lose their marbles, and they don't want to deal with it, and so they don't necessarily mean to be holding you up, but they're, in their own way, trying to deal with their own worries about the horse coming unhinged um, once you go around. I spent one year on the cup committee, and it, it was amazing. I learned a lot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, the cup, committee, the cup committee is there to support you the same way the vets and the volunteers are and ride officials. Yeah. Um, we're there to help you if you need something um, and all of that. So, you know, look to us as a resource, not as, oh, there's the people that are judging me. No, there, nobody's judging you. We're there to help you because we all want to see you finish, and we know that, you know, this is a tough one to get to the finish line on, okay? Um, let's see. I know you guys are probably getting hungry. So uh, I know you guys are doing a night ride. There's a really good article, a short one in here that um, I think Jeff wrote it. That's on page uh, 21, talking about headlamps. Um, I wrote an article in there, also talked a lot about riding in the dark. You have time to practice riding in the dark. You said it earlier, horses see really well in the dark. Yeah, they do. Especially yeah. in moonlight. When the moon is out, your horse sees almost as good as right now. True, true story. And if you want to roll forward and have a safe ride, just ride in the dark. Have a headlamp for safety if you need it, but don't turn it on. Don't have glow sticks on. Just let the horse go. The horse, if, if your horse stays in the pasture overnight and the next morning when you go to feed him, they're still there. That doesn't always happen. Just in one piece. I mean, it doesn't always happen, but... Generally speaking, if the horse is still in one piece the following morning, probably sees pretty well in the dark. So here's the thing. When you guys ride out tonight and you start, I don't know when you plan to start, right, at, right as it's getting dark, right at sunset, you have a half hour before it's actually dark. So if you're riding Tevis and you go, okay, it's going to be dark at 821, you have until 851 before it's actually dark. So you got a half hour to truck along, get her done, like pick it up. Plus horses after dark, they're amazing. It's like you got a fresh horse under you. You're like, everything started over again. You're like, hell yeah. You know, you got through the doldrums, 5 p.m. till 7 p.m. Your horse is going to drag a boat anchor and, um, and you're going to wonder whether or not you should still be out there. The wind changes here. So we have up canyon winds in the morning, down canyon in the evening. And there's a two hour window where that wind doesn't move. Five to seven, no wind, be hotter than hell. Your horse is like, screw you, and that's it, right? Just ride through it, wait till it gets dark. They pick right back up again. You got a fresh horse to ride. But that half hour after the sun goes below the horizon, make time. It's not dark yet. Pick it up, right? And then let the horse travel at night. The horse knows where he's going. He can do it. And light pollution is a real problem, plus, you know, you might have a horse that has some kind of eye issue. I have a horse with cataracts, injury-induced cataracts in her left eye, and she gets any refractory light or light pollution, she ducks, she's out from under me. It's very dangerous for me. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do hundreds with her because too many people are, hate to say it, afraid of the dark and wearing all this crap all over their horses because they somehow think that helps. Having been at Francisco's, Cup committee, between cup committee and volunteering there, probably easily 12 years now. Um, seen a lot of riders sick when they get there from vertigo because you're riding the lights. Woo! It'll get you. It's bad. Um, and so think about that too. You'll sit better and ride better at night than you do in the daytime. Promise you that. You'll, you'll be like, wow. I'm like an Olympic dressage rider right now. I sit so amazing. I'm so tall. I'm so connected. I feel every nuance of my horse. My horse goes, and I just, 
I feel it with my leg. I mean, it's amazing, right? I mean, you have this glorious experience you can't have any other way. And then on top of it, your horse that trips in the daytime doesn't trip in the dark. Your low flyer that at the walk is like, and you think, I hate, hate this horse, right? Okay, in the dark, he goes, da -da, I'm amazing, I'm an amazing horse, right? I never trip, and you're like, what the hell, dude? And then the daylight comes back, and the horse is like, you know, I've ridden that. <laughs> I had a horse, low flyer, stumbled all the time at the walk, rode her on Virginia City 100 one year. She was incredible in the dark, incredible. We even came around the corner in the pinion pine, and it got stupid dark. We had just made it through all the quartz rock where you can't see the markers and you don't know where the trail is and you're kind of hoping that you're heading in the right direction. And we turn this corner in the pinion pine and all of a sudden the mare stops and she goes, are you good? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, all right. And then we went down this hill. I mean, it was steep. She stopped at the top, and I caught her looking back at me like, you all right? You got this? And I'm like, okay. So just kind of like John Wayne that, little John Wayne. All right, and then we went down the hill. They'll take care of you. You got to trust them. Practice it. You will learn more about you and your horse's relationship in the dark, like real dark, dark, that you won't learn any other way. You can't, you can't learn it if you fake it, okay? So I have one more assignment for you to do because you might have to walk in the dark on your feet. Okay, and then I'm going to let you go because they're calling for dinner. Yep, this is our last thing. Okay, so I'm going to get up on the thingy here. Hopefully you can all see me a little bit. When we walk, when people walk, we walk like this. Toes up. Heels up, toes up, heels up. You can't walk like that in the dark, okay? So you put this foot down, you stay on this leg, don't lift this leg. Stay on this leg, you roll all the way forward onto your toe until it's flat, now you can lift this foot up. And you put this one down, roll all the way forward till you are got put weight in it, then you put the next one up. If you wanna really challenge yourself, go back and see like your horse, do this, oh, yeah, do, it. do this, and you gotta go until your foot is all the way flat and you can be sure you can put weight on it and then you can lift up your back foot, okay? You can't lift up your back foot until your front foot's all the way down. So tonight, after you're done with your ice cream ride, you're all gonna walk around in the dark. You won't need to tent your nose because it'll be dark, okay? You cannot pick up your back foot until your front foot's all the way down. There you go. That's how you walk in the dark and you don't fall. And then oh if you step God. into a hole, you still have this leg planted, right? You're like not committed yet. I'm going to put this one all the way down. Yep, that's good. Yep, that one's good. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, I got it. Okay, and that's your walk in the dark assignment. Thank you, okay. Aaron. All right. I can walk on ice.